What are Blender extensions and what happened to Blender add-ons in the 4.2 release? In this video, I'll go over everything that you need to know about Blender extensions from a user's point of view and an add-on developer's perspective. If you're new here, I'm Victor Stepanoff and I love helping artists learn the Python programming language. Let's get started. With the release of Blender 4.2, a ton of great features have been shipped. One of the main features of this release are the Blender extensions. A Blender extension could be an add-on or a theme. Since this channel is focused on Python development, we're gonna be focusing on the add-on part of the extensions. Let's start from a user's point of view. In the preferences, you'll notice that the themes are now under the add-on section, and we got a new section called Get Extensions. If you open up the add-on section, you'll notice that not a lot of add-ons are now bundled with Blender. The other add-ons that used to be bundled with Blender were converted into extensions and moved to the Blender extensions platform. We'll take a look at that in just a second. In the add-on section, you'll still be able to enable and disable add-ons, go to the documentation, and also you'll notice that the add-ons that are listed here are actually built in and you won't be able to uninstall them. You will be able to uninstall the legacy add-ons that you install. Now, let's take a look at the Git Extensions section. Here, you'll see that the user will be greeted with a message that Blender would need internet access. By default, Blender will not be able to access the internet and the user will need to allow it to do so. Now, the Blender developers have underlined that Blender will never need internet access for its core functionality. Only when a user would need to use the extensions platform, they would require that internet access. Once the user has enabled that internet access by clicking on allow internet access or in the system section of the preferences, the user will be able to install any of the add-ons that are listed in the Blender extensions platform. Blender developers have provided us with some command line arguments that will allow you to fully disable internet access so the user won't be even able to enable it in the preferences or you would automatically allow internet access. This is great if you're using Blender in a studio or an educational setting. With the internet access enabled, Blender will allow users to download extensions from the official Blender extensions platform or any other third-party extensions platforms. The official Blender extension platform is a major feature that allows us to have a single curated list with high quality and free add-ons to choose from. It allows us to have a streamlined and straightforward way to update all those add-ons right from the Blender's UI. There are a number of ways for a user to install extensions. One of them is of course using this Get Extensions UI. Another way how a user could get an extension is by using the official Blender extensions website by dragging and dropping their extension that they selected right into Blender. You can actually drag and drop that into a text editor and you can see that it'll provide a link that the Blender then uses to download the extension. Another way you can get an extension is by downloading the zip archive as you would usually do with legacy add-ons and then selecting the install option to a drop down and selecting install from disk. You can also use this to install legacy add-ons. And the final way a user could install extensions is by using the so-called local repositories. By default, Blender will have a user and a system repository where users can add unzipped extensions that will automatically be installed. The system repository could be used by educational facilities and studios to deploy extensions across all their teams or their students. Now let's take a closer look at what happened to all those add-ons that were bundled with Blender all these years. Most of them, as I mentioned, were converted into extensions and now are hosted on the extensions platform. By the way, a number of these add-ons on the Blender extensions platform don't have an owner. And if you're interested in making code contributions to Blender, these extensions are a great way to start out. A set of very popular Blender extensions were moved into a group called Core Add-ons. Most Blender users are familiar with these add-ons like Rigify and Node Wrangler, and some of these add-ons might eventually become part of Blender. For example, the add-on Images as Planes has now become a official built-in operator, and now you don't need to install any extension to get that functionality. 
Okay, now let's take a look at what the add-on developers should expect from extensions. Every extension should have a manifest file, which is called Blender Manifest Toml. This manifest would contain information similar to what you would usually put in the BL Info dictionary that you would usually define for an add-on. We don't need to define the BL dictionary anymore. All that information would be stored in that manifest file. Not all of the fields are the same in that manifest file. Compared to the BL info dictionary, some of the fields you might recognize in the manifest file, but some will be new. There is a following set of required fields that you need to define. Something worth mentioning is that you would need to specify which license you're going to be distributing your add-on code under. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, make sure to leave a comment under this video so I can understand that I would need to create a quick overview of code licenses and what it actually even means. Some of the optional fields that are worth highlighting are the permissions, where you can specify what resources your add-on will need to function. You can also specify which platform or operating system your add-on supports, and probably one of the bigger changes for add-ons that have dependencies on third-party Python packages is the requirement for you to bundle your dependencies with your extension. There are a number of ways that you can do this. The recommended way is to use a Python wheel where another field actually is in the in the manifest will be a relative path to those Python wheels. This is actually where the OS and platform can tie in. A number of Python packages might not be cross-platform and work on only a couple of operating systems. You will see this in some of the published extensions on the extensions platform where the add-on only works on Windows or has separate links for each operating system that it supports. The bare minimum extension would look like this. It's a zip archive with a double underscore in a dot pi and a manifest. So if you had an add-on that was just one file, this is how it would be packaged as an extension. If your add-on requires internet access, the Blender developers have provided us a way to check if a user has enabled internet access or if they're running a version of Blender that has disabled internet access. The changes that are required on the code side is that you need to make sure that all of your imports to internal modules are now relative and anywhere where you were using the name of the add-on in quotes, you need to replace that with double underscore package double underscore. Last but not least, you can automate the creation of extensions by using a new extension build command. This will be handy in the cases where you need to create multiple versions of your extension for different platforms, for example. Now that you understand what extensions are, you might be wondering what you need to do to upgrade your current legacy add-on to an extension. And in this video right here, I'll be showing you how you can do that. 